Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Dearest Hector, and so to the Costa Blanca and to Benador. Then notice the expert where I handle this powerful machine. Now, Hector, I know you're a bit of a slob and look down your nose at resorts like this, but I've been looking forward to this mini break for ages. But, like it or not, Hector, this epitomizes the very essence of Spain for millions and millions of people each and every year. And for the discerning gastronaut, it's a brilliant challenge to try to discover the culinary heart of the Costa Blanca. <laughs> Once upon a time, this used to be a sleepy fishing village, minding its own business on the shores of the Mediterranean, until some bright spark a hundred years ago placed an ad in the newspaper encouraging people to sample the excellent beaches. Incidentally, in those days, you could rent a villa for as little as tuppence a day. Well, as they say, the rest is history. And although it's not the most sensitive piece of town planning in the world, it has the priceless ability to turn the elderly into sprightly teenagers, making the blood pump faster. And quite frankly, Hector, I know that you think of Spain as Cervantes, Goya and Rioja, but any place that puts a smile on the face and lifts the spirit in this mean and crazy world can't be bad. Anyway, as this is supposed to be a cookery program, I thought I'd visit my latest, latest chum, Terry Williams, who runs a bar come restaurant. He caters mainly for the Brits. He even imports English sliced bread and roast and three veg on the menu every day. But one of his most popular dishes is saffron rice, with peppers, onions and garlic, simply stir-fried. More Chinese than Spanish, I'd say. Still, so what? This is the magic dish of the day. But Terry's own speciality is spare ribs roasted to perfection after marinating in cayenne, lemon juice and garlic overnight. Quite delicious, especially when you wash it down with an agua de la Valencia, the local tipple. And now, Terry's going to give me a crash course in how to prepare this wonderful mixture. Oh, this goes very OK. Right, here you go. Catch that right then. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> what else goes in? And then you put some orange juice. Orange juice, fine. As per, this is why I call agua Valencia, because oranges come from the region of Valencia, so this is one of the reasons it's called that. Then we put some local champagne in. Does this make go pop this time? Is this, is this a bit alcoholic or is this a little refreshing? No, drink? it's just a nice refreshing drink to keep you going on the, and the parties and the, and the many fiestas that we have here. That's the champagne. It's a little bit like your Bucks Fizz at home. But the magic ingredient is the local, another local drink called Cointreau, which is made... It's a liqueur of oranges. And we add that, all that in. <laughs> and this is how it goes. We just finish it off with a bit of orange juice. Stir it up. Chisel and stir up. And this will guarantee to get every party flying and buzzing. Oh, Cheers. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you tell me that this is just a light, refreshing little... Um... It is indeed. Bless you. Cheers. Well, have you legless... Thank you. They'll have you legless in no time, this stuff. <laughs> do they get a bit? I mean, do they drink a bit around here? Well, they enjoy themselves. I mean, normally they say Spain... You don't see many Spanish drunks in the street like you, you know, we hear about in the UK. But if you see a fiestas, where they really, then they really let their hair down. They enjoy themselves in three or four days of the local fiestas, and they really have a ball. And these are some sort of drinks that they have. Fiesta or no fiesta, there's nothing like a spot of sea air to cure the excesses of the night before and stimulate an appetite. But what's for lunch? Where do I find something really authentic, simple and nourishing? Does she know? Does he care? You see, I'm fed up with pizzas, chicken and chips, chili con carnies, quiche and chips, hamburgers. I want something really real. So, with an expert piece of gastronomic sleuthing, I find this brilliant restaurant in the back streets of Old Benidorm. Right, this should be an amusing little sketch because my newest chum, Carmen, and I cannot speak a language in common. So we're gonna be a bit muddled as we go along here. She's making her speciality, which is called a Roth Abanda. It's a simple rice dish which relies on a very, very strong fish stock to impart the flavour to the rice. Would you like to come over here, Clive? I'll try and spin you around the ingredients if I can. 
The fish stock, which is in here, has been made from these lovely shrimps and this big fish and the little red fishes here, all simmered lovingly so you've got lovely rich stock. She also has little bits of chopped squid, OK? And then, as usual with so many of the Spanish dishes, the picata, which in this case is red peppers dried with garlic and parsley and chopped into little fine pieces. Right over here, what she's already done, I mean, I feel I'm sort of talking behind her back in a way, but I can't, I mean, can't do it any other way. She's fried some pieces of squid in olive oil and put some short-grained rice into it and a little bit of her picata. OK, that's what she's doing, and she'll add some stock to that as we go along. Now, what am I doing? I am simply frying some slices of potato, OK, in olive oil. Like that, because they form the basis of my simple fish hot pot, which is slices of firm white-fleshed fish, slices of onion, which are put into an, into an earthenware casserole in layers, covered in tomato sauce, sprinkled with breadcrumbs, popped in the oven until it's baked and delicious. So I'll get on doing that. Spuds can come out. It's just for them to take the oil. They don't have to be cooked at this stage because the cooking process takes place in the oven. Now, Carmen's just added some fish stock to her rice, and I guess she'll leave that to simmer now for about 15 minutes. Right, now I fry a few of these onion rings, just again to absorb the oil, not to completely cook them. While they're simmering away, I have to dredge this fish in flour. I know it's very cramped for you, Clive. I hope you can see, all right? If you want me to lift these up, you nod your head and I'll lift them up closer. He didn't nod his head, so I assume everything's all right. OK, dredge the fish in, in flour. The onions are now cooked enough so they can go into the, into the earthenware casserole. So, Carmen's dish is simmering on a gentle heat and the rice will take on all the flavours of the rich fish stock and the spiciness of the piccata. Meanwhile, I've coated my fish in flour and lightly fried it and added it to the potatoes and onions. A little bit of paprika right across the whole thing, like so. Then some breadcrumbs over the top of the whole thing, like that. A couple of cloves of garlic to roast with it. Like that. Gracias, senora. And some lovely fresh tomato sauce. That now goes into the oven for about 30 or 40 minutes. And halfway through the cooking process, back up to me for a sec, please, Clive. Halfway through the cooking process, I'm going to pour a little pasties and a little white wine into that just to moisten it and bring out a few more flavours into the whole thing. OK? So there we are. I think most of our regular viewers will know what an oven looks like, so I'll just take it away and pop it into the oven down here. Gracias, senora. Magnificent, it's time for a quick slurp. Ah, Marquez de Caceres. Mm. What a fine fellow he is, too. He's my new chum. Finally, during the last few minutes of cooking, baby squids, chipperones, are added. And when the dish is finished, it's traditional to eat it with a garlic mayonnaise. Now, I did say that halfway through the cooking process, I'd add a couple of other ingredients. Can you remember what they were? It was perno or pastis and a little bit of white wine. So we'll do that at this stage. The dish is partly cooked, so just... A little drop of that, not too much. It gives a nice aniseed flavour to go with the fish. It goes very well. And a drop of white wine just to moisten it, like so. And back in the oven for another what, half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that, and it'll be time to eat it. <laughs> I was really pleased with my fish stew, and adding the anisette gave it a lovely aroma of fennel and kept the fish moist. It was good enough to bless any dinner party. But Carmen's Arroz a la Banda was fantastic. It's worth an aeroplane ticket to Benidorm just to try it. It's one of the best dishes I had in the whole of Spain. Every pub has a story. Usually it's to do with escaping from the humdrum to find excitement and eternal happiness. My latest chum, John Wardell, has been here for 16 years and he's seen it all. Now, is there anybody in the room who, who speaks Spanish? 
C. Hey, yeah, C, la. I speak Spanish, yeah? It's great when they come over here, you see them coming up to the bar, you know, and the fella says, I'll get these. Two old Coca-Cola, oh, por favor, oh. Uh, no, no ICO. And the woman says, oh, Jeff, aren't you good? <laughs> Thanks, John. The check's in the post. But I'm off for an early one to get some inspiration for cooking sketch numero dos. And what better place than the fruit and vegetable market in Benidorm? Actually, the only way to work out what you want to do when you're stumped for ideas is come to the market. And because I know that here hundreds and hundreds of years ago, when it was inhabited by the Arabs, they ate a lot of vegetables. And people often criticise me for doing no vegetarian meals at all on my programme. I'm going to break the rule of a lifetime and buy the ingredients to make a gypsy, Moorish-style vegetable stew. That's what this market tells me to do, so that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. What's the cost, Senora? Tres, tres cientos. I thought I'd cook my vegetable dish in the mountains just outside Benidorm, where, for centuries, the land was dominated by the Moors. And, a little gastronomic note here, it's curious to think that if the Arabs hadn't introduced rice to Spain, then her signature dish, paella, might never have been born. But we should be cooking a huge paella much later. Now I'm going to cook this little dish that the Arabs might have done centuries ago. So, Clyde, you'd like to come in, spin round the ingredients. Curious ingredients they are, too. Pears, peeled pears, green beans, pumpkins and some chickpeas which I've already boiled and they're virtually cooked because they take a long time otherwise. Now, in here, very important with Spanish cooking, some finely chopped onions and tomatoes sweating down in lovely olive oil. Okay, that's the base of our stew. But as with so many Spanish dishes, you've got to have the picata. This is the picata. In this case, this is ground almonds, fried bread, and garlic and vinegar and olive oil all crushed up together and to make it absolutely splendid we put in a few strains of saffron like so and a little bit of paprika and that all gets mashed up into a nice smooth paste which not only thickens the stew but it also enriches it and gives it a nice moorish araby kind of flavor with the almonds right so that's all happy there now in with the imperial chickpeas and the water they've been cooked in. Okay, put that much away. Chickpeas, olive oil, tomato, and onion. In with the pumpkin. Wonderful colours: golden, red, yellow, green. They go in like that. The pears pop on top, like so, and then we stir in our paste which will thicken and enrich this delicate thing. Pop the lid on and let it simmer away for about 40 minutes until the whole thing is tender, succulent and cooked. Now, what I'm going to do, because I'm in a vineyard and on somebody's farm, <laughs> I'm going to... Seven weeks I've been in this country now and I haven't learned how to use one of these things yet and the director's determined I should get it all down my shirt and of course I will. How do you do this? Hmm. You get down your shirt, in your eyes, but my God, it tastes jolly nice. I think I have it out of a glass, though. There have been vineyards here ever since Hannibal wandered past with his elephants, but these vines give cover to the birds which live a dreadful existence in these hills. I'm not opposed to popping the odd pigeon for the pot myself, but I draw the line at thrushes, blackbirds and larks. Anyway, my stew turned out beautifully, and it had a rich, lovely almondy flavour. And what with the pumpkins, the green beans, the chickpeas and the pears, it was delicious. You know, I sometimes get fed up with meat. I'm not a vegetarian, though, but this is the sort of thing it's quite nice to have from time to time. Anyway, I've been invited to lunch at the Masaroff Vineyard by the owner Peter Pateman, who's been a sailor, a sheep farmer and a lumberjack. And he's OK. He's cooking pigs in his 14th century oven. 
Now they're dusted with wild rosemary and basted with honey and wine. It'll take about two hours on wood mark four. So while they cook away, I thought I'd make the perfect first course, a dish that not only tastes wonderful and refreshing, but typifies the landscape and the history of the area. And it also gives Clive and myself the opportunity to get out of the hot kitchen and savour the delicious aromas of wild thyme and rosemary from the hillside. But you won't be able to smell them from there, Clive. Thank you, Clive. That's much better. Now you can see what I'm really up to, which is to make a very simple but refreshing and typical soup of this region from almonds. Here are the almonds, OK? And in fact, if you glance over my holes in one of your lovely wide shots, you'll see orchards of almond trees all over the place. That's the basic ingredient. Also, we've got some grapes that go into it, some breadcrumbs, some garlic, which I've pounded into a smooth paste in my pestle and mortar here. Very smooth, lovely garlic, some lemon juice, and something I very seldom taste myself, but I tell you, it is really good stuff. It's water. So, we assemble this simple soup thus. First of all, pop the garlic into our soup bowl, soup terrine. Stir it round the bottom a little bit. Add some almonds. I have to confess, I've never made this soup before, so it's a little bit of trial and error. Let me go with some water, stir that round in so that the almonds, which are finely ground, it looks like, um, at the moment, I have to admit, it looks a little bit like wallpaper glue, but I promise you, as time goes on, it'll get rather splendid. Whisk, 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 whisk. See, out in the country here, we're in a 14th century farm which has no electricity, so the cook skills are really tested to the full today. There are no electric blenders, no grinders, no electricity of any sort. Right, here we go, Clive. This is thickening up nicely now. A little taste, because this is a suck it and see dish, really. Mmm. Right, next, a little bit of wine vinegar. I think a bit more almond will go down very well in there. And two, three. And, by the way, the reason this soup is going to taste very, very nice is because the almonds are fresh. They're not dried ones. If you do try to make this at home, try to get the almonds which have come in their shells. Right, some lemon. Look at that. Everything from the mountainside is going into this dish, actually. The garlic, the grapes, the almonds, the bread. Do you know, it's wonderful. I can't describe to you how good it is. In with the grape. Oh, they're um, shooting here today. Just about everything that crawls, flies, swims, or hurtles about the land is being blasted out of the countryside because it's the first day of the Spanish shooting season. Drop more water. A little drop of olive oil. Absolutely wonderful. Refreshing, it's Spanish, it's Moorish, it's delicious, the sun is shining, and I'm extremely happy. Look at it, Clive, big close-up of that. Very interesting looking stuff. The lunch that afternoon was magical. Peter's friends, relations and neighbours came round. The air was scented with roast pork and rosemary, and the strong red wine was starting to have some effect. Right in the middle. Peter looked as if he'd just stepped out of a Hemingway novel, and I had the strong impression that this afternoon he wasn't going to take any prisoners, and my instincts were right. The last thing I did was pour some honey, you know, after we finished, yeah. Right, well, I poured right, right. honey, and it's honey from the mountain there. It's, it's a natural honey from all the, all the herbs and everything else. The bees get all the stuff from the herbs, and the, and the things of the mountain. These are cooked in the juice. Now these are good Spanish Spanish onions. They're like apples. They're so you, so sweet you can eat them the way they are. Okay, they've been cooked in the juice from the uh, from the pig. And that's these are all apples. And they're sautéed. You got to sauté them in butter. You don't cook them too much. Right. You got to sauté them very lightly. Butter and, and butter and the and the juice, which has got wine and honey and everything else in there. Paradoxically, just a few miles from Benidorm, which is quintessentially capitalistic, lies the restaurant Casa Pinet, which believes strongly in the communist cause. Senor Pinet, the patron's father, 
used to be a sort of Robin Hood figure in these parts, robbing the rich to feed the poor, until he was incarcerated by General Franco for his troubles. Now Pinette, the younger, is taking the loot from coachloads of Belgian tourists, which seems perfectly fair to me. With the strains of the international reverberating through this Marxist museum, I mean a revolutionary restaurant or is it a commie cafe, it's humorous to think that in a few years' time, when the whole world has reverted back to free market economy, Signor Pinette's restaurant will still be flying the red flag for fun and profit, of course. Once upon a time, many hundreds of years ago, some fishermen set to sea for a day's fishing. They fished very busily until 12 o'clock, then they thought they should have some lunch. So they went to the cupboard to look for the rice to make a paella, only to discover to their chagrin and dismay that they'd forgotten the rice. But they did have some noodles, and hence this amazing dish, which I'm about to learn from my latest newest chum, Anita, was invented. First of all, we'll have a quick spin round all the ingredients. First of all, Clive, we have some calamaris, some little squidlets, okay, some tuna fish, some mixed white fish, a bowl of peppers, prawns, clams, mejones, shrimps and peas, okay, some tomato sauce. Here is what we have in every, virtually every Spanish dish, a thickening agent called a picata, and this picata is made from bread, olive oil, garlic, red pepper and parsley, okay, the raw ingredients are those ones there. We also have the noodles themselves, okay, and to decorate the dish finally at the end, some lovely mussels and some prawns, and right over here, some red peppers which have already been fried in oil. Now, that's all I know of this dish because Anita's going to show me what to do, so we're all in for a learning experience this morning. Primero, primero, si. primero the little squidlets. They all go straight into the oil. Okay, correct? Correct. Si. And they fry away there for un momento, dos Un momento, un momento. Ah, momento. Okay. The next thing that goes in as soon as Anita tells me it's okay, will be the tomato sauce. Segundo is the tomato sauce. In that goes. Right. And then next this one. This one. Right. Then the mixed fish goes in. Got that Clive big fat goes with all the lovely mixed fish. Monkfish and haddock and hake and goodness knows what. All in there. Okay. Next, the peas, the peppers, the clams, the little shrimps, they all go into the pot, like so. Looking quite colourful now. Now, I can't put the tuna in yet, Anita says, but what I can put in is the picata. Now, we've seen this throughout Spain in its different forms. This particular one is made of dried red pepper, garlic, olive oil, and I think she's put a few almonds in there as well, and some parsley. And this is the thickening agent for the stew. So one, dos, dos, very large mixtures of that, and stir it in. This will, ow! <laughs> I burnt my finger. That's okay, it's my fault. I should have not left the, um, the ladle on the gas like that. Mm -hmm. Right, next, little fillets of tuna fish. They're going in last because they take virtually the shortest time to cook. Todo es bueno. Todo bueno, sí. menos el caldo. <laughs> <laughs> right, tuna, and then some sal. Sal. Vamos a la sal. Poco, todo, mucho. Todo, 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 todo. That's a lot of salt. Sal. Right, salt. Right. Ahora, un poco y poner aquí. Ah, right. It's now going to simmer in here for a second and we transfer it to the massive paella dish itself for the next phase. Right. And we transfer... Okay. All right. This is not for the limp wristed, I can assure you. Right, there's that. So now we have to add uh, the pasta. Ahora la pasta. Ahora la pasta. Toda, eh? Todo. Toda. That's all the noodles in there. Yeah. And now we add many, 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 oh. many ladles of fish stock. Mas, mas. Dos. Mas. Mas. It's time just to finish it off by garnishing it. Firstly, with some fresh mussels. So an arrangement of a sort of circle around the whole pan, really. And some lovely Mediterranean prawns, black mm. against the red. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And last but not least, some wonderful roasted red peppers. Peppers have been roasted in olive oil and cut. It's actually a bit like being a childish painter, isn't it? Making a lovely big round-faced sun out of food. A happy plate of food. Painted in broad brush strokes of colour. The ochre, the black, the red, the gold, the green. Ah, right. There's an important bit. We don't waste anything in the Spanish kitchen. And that lovely flavoured oil from the pimentos goes around the whole thing. 20 minutes. Bubbles away right there on a low heat on this fabulous pan, and the next time you see it, we'll either have dropped it on the floor or we'll be eating it. Ah. <sighs> Mr. and Mrs. Pinnett proved that the cooking of really good food crosses all political boundaries. They liked it, they really liked it. And I liked it. It's a great dish, this noodle paella, and absolutely perfect for any kind of fiesta or a party. <laughs> Now, around here they're really big on paellas, and for parties and festivals they make these enormous ones. You can do this at home if you want. First of all, put some olive oil, around about five gallons, into a large pan. Wood mark four, and by the way, make sure it's orange wood. Add the chicken, the rabbit and duck to get the juices going, and the meat brown. This is superb fun, you know. Look at that sizzling, magnificent stuff. Then, chuck in a few tons of red and green peppers, about a kilo of finely chopped garlic. Mmm, yummy, yummy, yummy. I can smell it already. Then you need the entire contents of one supermarket's tomato department. Throw those in, about ten buckets full. Check the fire again, make sure it's simmering gently. Then a few bucketfuls of red and white and green beans. Actually, this is a genuine Valencia paella. It doesn't have any fish in it, you notice. Then five or six milk churns of water. You can get your husband to fetch that in. And meanwhile, go out of the garden, get about 8,000 snails and sling them in. Then start ringing up your bank manager, because you'll need a mortgage for this. The saffron's so expensive. Right, now some really good rice. Several buckets of rice. Incidentally, it's a short grain rice that comes from Valencia. Let that simmer away gently now for 20 minutes or so. Dampen the fire down so it doesn't overcook. Mmm, look at that. Brilliant. And all you have to do now is declare the day a national holiday, invite all your chums round, the doctor, the dentist, in fact, the whole town while you're at it, and you'll never have to give another dinner party ever again. <laughs> This is a celebration of the Christians and the Moors. 500 years or so ago, they were at each other's throats. And now, history is an excuse to have one hell of a party and dress up. And what's wrong with that, I hear you cry? It's customary on these occasions for Visigoths and Moors to smoke fat cigars. Thank goodness for Christopher Columbus. Or was it Sir Walter Raleigh? During the day, these guys are debt collectors and disco owners, or they sell leather handbags and cook chicken and chips. But tonight, they're all Charlton Heston. Clive, the photography was fantastic. Better than anything Cecil B. DeMille could do. 